ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you so very much. Hi and welcome everybody. It's great to see you. Tonight we take a look at the new world of work, people and machines. Every new industrial revolution has traditionally been met with trade-offs in employment opportunities and the new wave in industry marked by robotics, AI, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, raises a number of questions around how robotics and machines will impact the workforce in a variety of segments. And Michael Chewy of McKinsey is here to lead a discussion around how people and machines can work together most productively. Um, with us here also to weigh in are Guido Jure of ABB, Andrew Kay from Silicon Valley Robotics, Bruce McWilliams from Bossa Nova, and Deepak Sekar from Chowbotics. Chris Hammond was also on the docket this evening and was unable to get out of Chicago. Uh, the flights were canceled and he was fogged in, so he is not here tonight for the discussion. Uh, there is always, for every Churchill program, a group of people who merit our gratitude. And we would especially like to thank Guido and ABB for making this program possible tonight. Thank you so much. And then also Peter Lowe of Zeno for his excellent project management, and Greg Wood, and Michael Chewy for invaluable content and framing assistance. Thank you all. We definitely couldn't have done it without you. A few quick words about the Churchill Club. We have proudly served for over three remarkable decades of change here in the Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area region of innovation. We present about 24 programs every year in the interest of encouraging innovation, economic growth, and social good. We try to, we think of ourselves as forward leaning in the sense that we're trying to get at what trends today imply for opportunities tomorrow. And we always ask our speakers never to pitch, promote, or position. And we appreciate that very much. If you're not already following us, we invite you to do so on our mailing list on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And the hashtag tonight, by the way, is simply Churchill Club. So thanks very much for your attention. Let us now give a very warm welcome to our panel. No robots? OK. <laughs> All real people here. Um, welcome, and thank you for coming. Thanks to the Churchill Club. Thanks to ABB uh, for hosting uh, this discussion. I hope we'll make it uh, interesting uh, and um, uh, informative. Um, I'm going to just start with uh, just a few comments uh, to, to introduce the, uh, the topic. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, will there be a robot apocalypse? You know, will there be jobs for people, et cetera? And um, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of that, but I'll tell you a little bit of some of the research that we've done at the McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, again, we do think that there's tremendous, and, and you know, some of the technologies that the panel um, has been implementing do show what's actually possible. You know, we've, we've talked about you know, analyzing every activity that people are paid to do in the global economy, and something like 50% of the time we pay people to work, uh, they're doing activities which potentially could be automated by adapting technologies which already exist. So that does sound like potentially a robot apocalypse. But it takes actual time for some of these things to happen. So by the year 2030, we think it might be more like 15%, right? We, we, it could be higher, it could be lower, but that's the midpoint of the, of the scenarios we uh, um, you know, modeled out. That said, we actually think that it's very rare that you know, a machine will be able to do everything that a single person does in their job. And so it's much more likely, and we find this to be true, that there are individual activities which any person that they do in their job could potentially be automated by AI or robotics, et cetera. And so basically what this is is this will affect all of us. This won't be just affect a certain number of workers in certain places. This will has a wide-ranging effect. And we do see the potential by modeling fairly straightforward things like aging, like 
increased prosperity around the world, another billion people entering the consuming class, the need for infrastructure and buildings, the need to deploy and, and develop technology, energy transitions, even paying for what's currently unpaid work at home. We think there's enough work for people to do, but the challenge might be getting people from one place to another, and also how can you have people work together with the machines? And I think we'll try to cover some of these uh, topics uh, with our esteemed panel this evening. So um, you do have uh, everyone's bio uh, there as well, but it, it, it doesn't say exactly uh, what the machines are that each of your individual companies uh, make do, which I think is a bit of a German uh, linguistic construction. But in any case, um, like Guido, let me start with you. ABB, I don't know what that stands for, uh, but what, <laughs> what, what are the machines that you make uh, that... that, that um, are robots, basically. Right. Yeah. So thanks, Michael. So ABV actually stands for ASEA Brown Bovary. So the roots of the company being uh, ASEA company merging with the Brown Bovary. But let me talk about the robots. So we're one of the world's largest purveyors of robots, and most of our robots are sitting in factories. So essentially, they're building cars. And one of the interesting statistics is that when we talk about the robots are coming, um, you actually haven't seen anything yet. 70% of the robots by value are sitting in automotive factories. So the vast majority of robots are not anywhere else just yet. But that will change, and I'm sure that my fellow panelists will describe those. But so our robots are applied in industrial context, and one of the interesting evolutions of our product range would be what we call collaborative robots. So these are robots that are designed no longer to live in cages, but who can work safely side by side with people. Why do you put your robots in cages? That seems it's, cruel. It seems so awfully, yeah, I know. But both basically because they're dumb. So essentially, most robots don't have sensors, and they can pick up heavy objects, but they could equally just as well take off your head. So if you put them in a cage to protect us from the robot, but the new robots, the collaborative robots, they have sensors, and they can stop, and they can make sure not to hurt you. And that's why they can work side by side with people, which opens up all kinds of new potential. Uh, Andra, tell us what's going on at, at Silicon Valley Robotics. Okay. Yeah. I have the best job in the world because I don't have to make any robots myself. We know how difficult that is. The robots do that, right? Making the robots and making the robots to make the robots, which was always a problem with Foxconn reckoning that they would have one million robots in factories in 2014, is because in 2014, the sum total of all robots in the world was just over a million. So the question had to be, who was going to build the robots? You know, that, anyway, they didn't quite meet that goal. But Silicon Valley Robotics is a, an association started by robotics companies to support the growth of the new wave of robotics. And that is, at the moment, it is really centered in Silicon Valley more than anywhere else in the world. Even though fantastic research happens elsewhere, and some of the world's largest robotics companies are not American at all, um, nonetheless, the innovation, the vast majority of all new companies being formed and being invested in, in robotics, is happening here right now. And Silicon Valley is so spoiled because robotics is the tiny little frog in a really, really big pond, and everybody overlooks it. But the reality is we've had 50 years of, as Guido put it, dumb, stupid robots that are locked up in cages in factories. Now we have smart robots that are capable of working outside of cages in factories and everywhere else. And so what I see is a plethora of new potential robotic marketplaces, and that can be for mobile platforms, whether we call them self-driving cars or delivery robots or drones or self-driving cargo ships, or whether we call them social robots that are having conversations with us. And I would argue that Alexa is at one end of that scale, the most simple end, but is still a social robot. And you know, part of this is, what is a robot? It senses, it thinks, and it acts. And almost every technology that we have these days is capable of sensing something in the environment around it, thinking about it autonomously, and taking an action. So Bruce, speaking of interesting company names, Bossa Nova. Uh, <laughs> well, the founder uh, liked Brazil, so that's why he picked the name, Sergio. Uh, uh, we make robots uh, 
in retail, uh, and uh, what's kind of unique about our company, I think we're the first company to start to deploy in uh, large, larger numbers uh, robots that are right there alongside people shopping uh, and people working. Our robots, uh, we're in 50 stores uh, uh, in, in Walmart, uh, um, it's public. Uh, um, so um, the robots go up and down the aisles of the store. They take high resolution photographs of all the products in the store. And then there are three computers on the robot and uh, um, with AI we determine what's out of stock, uh, is the pricing correct on the product, um, what products are misplaced, and provide data for store operations. So we're replacing the, uh, uh, we're doing what is done by hand today and takes one of our robots about two minutes to go down an aisle and completely determine uh, the, the inventory. And uh, where a, a human doing that takes a long time. And so, What does uh, it look like, this thing, is it? Uh, it's about six foot tall, weighs, uh, I don't know, it's 300 pounds maybe? 250. 250, and um, um, uh, it has, uh, 15 high resolution cameras and then uh, 10 LIDARs and depth sensors and constructs a 3D map and can see people and go around the people, uh, keep track of what it's missed so it can go back and, and, and take that. And uh, today uh, they, they run two shifts a day, um, once providing data for restocking and then later in the day before the busy time in the store. Um, they will run uh, to, to restock, and so, um, you know, that's just a, a kind of an overview, and uh, um, you can see, see a video of it if you go on YouTube or something like that, I'm sure. Deepak, Chowbot, another great name. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. As the name suggests, uh, we build robots which make food automatically. You walk up to the robot, and uh, there's a touch screen and you can pick the type of salad you want. Our first product does salads automatically. We call it uh, Sally the Salad Robot. So you <laughs> <laughs> Sally sounds like salad, that's how the name came. Uh, so uh, you walk up to the touch screen, you can customize your salad the way you want. You can tell the robot how many calories you want in your salad, and the robot automatically makes the salad for you. And so we've seen adoption, uh, it's meant for uh, office cafeterias and restaurants and hotels. Uh, we've seen adoption in the office space uh, in the beginning. And the reason why we've seen excitement is if you go to an office salad bar, there's hundreds of people often with dirty hands, that's the spoons and the food. Uh, especially in flu season, you don't want that. Uh, and uh, the, the robot's a lot more hygienic. You know the calories before you make your salad as well. Uh, and one of the big draws for our product is the fact that a robot doesn't need to sleep, it's available 24 seven. So many offices now provide just lunch to the employees, they don't have dinner service because it's costly to have a bunch of people prepare dinner. So what they do is they put a robot in there, people load up the robot uh, around lunchtime and then go home in the kitchen. Uh, and employees can get food late in the night for dinner uh, all night as well. Uh, and we've also seen there are many small offices where you can't afford to have a full cafeteria and in places like that, people just put Sally in there, and Sally provides lunch as well as dinner. So what does Sally look like? Uh, Sally uh, actually looks uh, kind of boring, uh, not like the movies you see, uh, in, uh, not, not like the robots you see in the movies, uh, uh, because we had to keep costs down for this application, so it's a plain box. Uh, the robotics <laughs> comes in uh, on the inside because you've got so many different types of ingredients. How many? Uh, there's 22 types of ingredients in there. And so you got to dispense all these ingredients in a weight controlled manner, and that's where we needed a bunch of robotics. Super interesting. So you know the, the topic here is you know the new world of work, you know people and machines. And you know in our research, it's not the first time that we've had machines, and it's not the first time we've had workers. No. It's not even the first time that we've had them working next to each other, even if they're not, you know, these high tech cobots. But well, what's changed? You know, why, why is it that we've hit a point where this has become a topic that um, you know, people talk about you know, on the street, on Davos, you know, and, and other places? What's, what's important about that? I think the first part is maybe the progress of artificial intelligence, right? Where if something is just fairly dumb and mechanical, it doesn't seem like much of competition. Uh, with the progress we've seen on the AI side, now I think what we're seeing is some of these bots could be mostly software, some hardware, 
and they could start to displace not only blue collar tasks, but also white collar. So I think there's an element of that. But I also think there's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance in, in the public psyche because recent research shows that about 72% of Americans are concerned that robots could actually impact jobs. But another piece of research showed that 94% of people didn't think it would actually take their job, just, just yours, not, not mine. But, <laughs> so I, I think it's an interesting idea, but it's probably a little bit the, that combination of effects, right? Which is we see progress in AI, and then we project what that might mean for the rest of us. Why did you guys get into robotics? I mean, how, how did you end up at this point going into this field? Partly because if you're at all worried about what the future will bring, the best place to work out what's coming down the pipeline is as deep into the technologies as possible. So I very consciously went back and retrained in understanding robotics technologies with an interest in seeing how that would be the next wave of technology changing the way society and our economy operated. We continue to have technological revolutions. And as um, Roy Amara's law goes, we overestimate the impact in the short term, but we vastly underestimate the impact in the longer term. And quite often, we buy a short-term rhetoric, whether it's good or bad, and completely ignore what the long-term impacts will be, whether they are good or bad. So. A lot of the rhetoric around robots taking jobs is, to my mind, it's a very shallow and short-term take that is, it's fear-based rather than reality-based. The reality is that we have been displacing jobs through computerized automation and process automation for a long time already, and that's going to continue with robots being part of it. It also gives us opportunities, though one of the things that I find strange is that we worry about robots taking manufacturing jobs. But have you seen a photograph of factory workers? It's a roboticized task. It's not a task that we should be asking people to do. So I believe right now we have a wonderful opportunity to discuss the whole concept of work, of labor, of profit, and ownership. Deepak. Yeah, so I, I got involved in robotics because I got tired of making my food at home. So <laughs> one evening I started... Uh, your memory, how does that... How do you go from that to yeah, so Sally? I started building this robot which made Indian food automatically. That's what my wife and I eat. Mm -hmm. And so I, I built this... Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, keep going. <laughs> so, so I started... I built this robot which made Indian food and I was going around showing it off to people. And I met this guy who owned 15 McDonald's stores. And he told me, uh, instead of building an Indian food robot for your home, why don't you build a salad making robot for my restaurant? And he felt that would be a big hit because uh, he'd seen in McDonald's that they were trying to make a French fry robot nearly 15 years back. And they failed uh, really badly because uh, the robot was very complicated. It had grease uh, and it was getting spoiled all the time. And so his thing was, uh, uh, build something very, very simple, which you can actually take to market quickly. And he felt salads would be one of the simplest types of food possible. And that's how Sally the salad robot was born. And so it's an interesting story. Uh, it came from uh, my need to not cook every evening at home. I am not even joking here. When is the Indian food robot coming? <laughs> uh, so it turns out Indian food is one of the more sophisticated pieces of food to make. And the market is smaller than salads, so. <laughs> However, there are many entrepreneurs who keep trying to crack that one because I have met a number of other Indian robot food makers or robot Indian. Uh, yeah. It's a competitive yeah, I market. I remember uh, when I was doing my PhD at Georgia Tech many years back, uh, I had this habit of making things uh, very complicated. And my PhD advisor, uh, he knew I'd listen to him if, I, if he name dropped. Uh, so he said he was uh, working uh, three rooms away from uh, Bill Shockley at Stanford. And he said Shockley always uh, told him, try simplest cases. That was a saying Shockley's uh, very famous for. He's even written papers about that. And so uh, we, he knew that if he used Shockley's name on me, I'd listen. And I've learned uh, since that day. All right. 
for, has anything happened that made this bossa nova six foot, 250 pound, it sounds like a linebacker, uh, yeah, robot possible robot. now? I mean, it, uh, what's made it possible now? Well, um, um, you know, I, I guess uh, uh, you know, the deep learning AI uh, software. So, uh, it, you know, it's actually quite hard to recognize uh, the products because uh, labels are constantly changing, you know, whether it's Christmas or Halloween, or so you just can't have a simple library or if it's a can of soup, every rotation uh, is there. So uh, the, um, so the uh, computer vision or computer image processing um, uh, has gotten very good with this uh, the deep learning. So the AI got to a point making it practical. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess it's a whole host of things. Our, our robot is really like a self-driving car. So uh, LIDARs and stuff that make that possible and, um, and, the, and the compute and the algorithms for navigation around people. And uh, so uh, the people that know how to do that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, are available. And, and so, so, I, I, so I guess it's the same thing as driving a self-driving car with the image processing that uh, uh, made it possible. Yeah, these technologies can be used at not almost anywhere now, right? Yeah. So um, let's get into it, right? So this idea of work and these machines doing what people used to do. Mm -hmm. And so, Gil, let's start with you, right? I mean, you, you talked about yep. uh, your robots being in a factory and sometimes being able to work side by side with human beings, but undoubtedly sometimes they're doing work that people used to do. Yep. How does that evolve? You know, I mean, people are losing their jobs, right? Right. I mean, I think I, I want to build on what Andrea was saying earlier, which is that this displacement of work has been happening for a long time, and this is just its latest manifestation. But what we there's two things. One is we actually need there's a, there's parts of our economy where we have lots of jobs that are going empty. So in some sense, the robots are coming. And you know, just in time, actually, in some ways, because if you think about um, even truck drivers, we talk about the truck drivers are going to get displaced. Well, there's 48,000 truck driving jobs that can't find drivers. Um, if you think about, you mentioned aging, old care, elderly care. In Japan, they have 400,000 empty positions for people taking care of the elderly now. Think of what it's going to look like when China ages, when uh, European countries start to age. Where are all these workers going to come from, right? So I think on the one hand, we talk about jobs getting displaced, but there's a lack of debate and discussion around the jobs that need to get filled now. And you know that's what Tom Friedman calls sort of the, the black elephant, right? It's not the swan, the random event. It's the, it's the elephant in the room. And while we talk a lot about certain uh, in professions getting impacted, maybe, for example, the coal miners, that's 40,000 jobs in the US. There's hundreds of thousands. There's actually probably about six million jobs in the US that are currently unfilled, for which we can't find the people. And think about what that happens as we look at a planet going to nine billion people. Where are we going to grow all that food? Well, it's going to have to be highly automated because we can't grow that food on more farmland because we don't have enough farmland to feed that many people. So we're going to have to go for urban farming. We're going to have to go for highly automated ways of producing that food. So, Ideally, the debate should shift to how do we cater to the growing need that we have. Jobs will always change. That, I think, is a given. So I'm curious, as you've you know, worked with your customers who are, you know, I, I, I think from our research, we'd agree there's enough work to be done, mm -hmm. but people might need to do very different things. That is right. And the retraining and transitions you know, could be huge. And you know, there are other issues about whether or not people can get to the place where there are jobs, et cetera. That is true. You know, do you see things happening on the customer side where they're addressing some of these some of these needs? Yeah, we see that more. Sorry, I'm going oh, yeah. to be brief and then I'll let. <laughs> but I think there's certain countries around the world where this is handled better than it is in the U.S. So in the U.S., unfortunately, and we're talking about that briefly with some of the people here present, if you get impacted, you get laid off. You're basically okay. That's tough. It's up to you now. Whereas I think in other parts of the world, we're seeing a bit more of a social contract between employers, government, education, trying to find ways to, first of all, assure that, first of all, you don't lose your health care, you have some, some, some form of income, and then there's a training opportunity. 
the same technology that so is, where, is where, where do we see this? Uh, where do you see this? Uh, for example, in Denmark, we have FlexiCare. Uh, with a recent What's article, FlexiCare? Flexi, uh, FlexiCare or FlexiCurity, I think is the actual term. So essentially, it says, look, if you're impacted and your job is eliminated, then the employer is on the hook for providing retrainment opportunities. The government will continue to provide you with health care and some basic income so that you don't starve while you're getting retrained. And I think that ability to take away that anxiety or uncertainty goes a long way. In fact, there was a recent article also in the New York Times about a mine in Sweden where the mine is getting progressively more automated. And they asked one of the people in the mine, they said, are you afraid of new technology? And the person basically said, no, I'm afraid of old technology. I, I want to make sure that I'm not going to be in a hazardous environment. I trust that the system around me will allow me to redeploy my skills to something new. Andrew. I completely agree that the social contract can be improved in many countries. You know, there are countries, uh, Australia's devolving, but we've had a universal health care. France has. There are versions of uh, dole or um, unemployment insurance. And I think it's sad that as many countries are moving away from these ideas, which are very important, but following on from what Guido was saying, it it's not to look at it as though this industry is employing robots, therefore jobs are going, because most of the industries in which robots are being employed are ones that there is a high job vacancy rate. That includes truck drivers, it includes manufacturing. So there are more vacancies than there are kind of... Also, I work a lot with startups getting investment, and you have to argue the case for why your company is going to create value if you're simply replacing labor which is cheap, you are not creating great value or profit. So first off, the incentive is really to be looking at robots for the areas where we do not have labor. And that includes healthcare, elder care, agriculture is a major area where, as said, we need to double world food production in this generation. The best land to farm is the land that we're building cities on, and those cities are expanding as the population increases. Pretty much all of the arable land is currently in use, whereas some things like uh, small autonomous farm vehicles could reduce soil compaction, and that is expected to be an 18% saving. That's returning land into usable land where it currently isn't. There's the idea of vertical farming and reducing the energy wastage of a lot of the food supply chain. There are actually some really interesting talks around at the moment with some of the vertical robotic farming companies and repurposing old shopping malls to become urban farm distribution, farms and distribution centers. So we're kind of repurposing the infrastructure. Uh, one of the other things as well is that fear of old machines, not new machines. I have even talked to a woman who's got a robotics company in India where she's working in agriculture. And I'm like, this is surely the cheapest agricultural labor in the world. I've seen the pictures. It's lots of women bent over in a field. And she says, yeah, but those women would prefer to have better tools. And they're willing to pay for them. So you find the appropriate technology. And instead of looking at it as a replacement for a person, it's good to look at it as an enhanced tool for the person, and that it often contributes more to the ownership of labor and the profit from it. The other area is mining, for example, truck driving, and the forestry industries have the highest death rates of all workplaces. So the jobs that we worry most about are the ones that we should be keeping people out of, in actual fact. On the whole, the robots really are doing the dirty, dull, dangerous jobs. I think that's shifting a little bit now that we're starting to get real white collar robots that are working in the shops. But certainly on the manufacturing, industrial factory space and agricultural space, I see it as a total positive. The other part about that is in the automotive industry, there have been studies that show the introduction of robots in the factory have resulted in an initial loss of jobs, but then a net increase in jobs because that factory became productive. And the factory that lost the most jobs 
is the one that shut down because it was no longer competitive. So as a worker, what you need to fear is not your company getting robots. You need to fear your company not getting robots. So Bruce, okay, yeah, people so. talk about a retail job apocalypse and you know, BLS statistics, although they're flawed because they don't include warehousing, do show you know, store employment right. uh, dropping. Yeah, so let me talk about our case in particular, but then I'd like to talk about the macro issue too. Just, uh, so uh, uh, one of the uh, best ways to increase sales um, you know, in a retail store is on-shelf availability that when the customer comes, the product is there on the shelf. Uh, a lot of sales are lost. Uh, I don't want to quote any numbers particularly. Uh, um, and the second thing is if there are people in the store to interact with the customer, they, they tend to buy more. Uh, so in our particular case, uh, um, our customer is finding that our robot finds 50% more out of, st out of stock or on shelf availability uh, things. And so they need a lot more labor to restock. And a robot is not cheaper than a person at restocking, but a robot is far cheaper at doing the inventory. I mean, in two minutes, we do a complete inventory of an aisle. So it's not clear, and, and they can also redeploy people to interacting with customers and make the store experience better uh, versus the inventory task, which uh, any employee will tell you that's the task he most hates doing, uh, is taking inventory. Uh, so it's not clear to me that it, our robot uh, lowers uh, the number of people. It just changes the nature of the work towards making the store a better experience for the customer. Now, uh, macro, you know, I, I see this. If we go back to 1800, 90% of the people worked on a farm. And uh, it was very upsetting to people that machinery and automation and farming was taking away jobs. But nobody could see that there were going to be jobs in manufacturing. Um, uh, in 1900, 90% or only 10% of the people work on the farm. And today, I think it's 7 tenths of 1% of the people have farming or agricultural jobs. So, uh, but net net, there are many more jobs today than there were then. So uh, it, I think what the thing that's different today is the rate of change um, is rapid. Um, and I don't worry at all about people that are young in their career who can re retool. I think the issue more is people that are further along in their career um, and, and can't necessarily retool. So two follow-up questions. Yeah. When will the Boss Nova robot be able to actually restock? Well, I think you could make a restocking robot today, but it's not cheaper than an, uh, an employee doing it. The robot doesn't do it faster. Uh, you know, a robot is an expensive piece of capital equipment. Uh, it's not as flexible. Um, it's not as clear, you know. So I don't, it, it doesn't do the job better than a human. Um, it it maybe at some point it will um, um, do more and more things. But, um, you know, why I got excited about Bossa Nova is, you know, we're orders of magnitude better at doing that job than humans, and humans don't want to do that job. Um, and. It, has a big impact. And you said you weren't worried about people early in your career, which implies you are a bit worried about people later in your career. Yeah, la later in the career, it's, 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 people have more difficulty uh, uh, retooling themselves. So what should we do about that? Um, you know, I don't necessarily have a solution for it, but. Um, <laughs> well, I think uh, we should apply some of the innovation that we're applying equally to robots to the question of education, right? And the, the, the education industry or the education model is notoriously resistant to change, but there are enabling technologies. We've seen the massively online courses. We're seeing augmented reality goggles. I mean, while they're a flop in the consumer space, in the industrial space that we serve, AR goggles are the future for new workers who have to do many things because we can make expertise available on demand. We can beam in an expert. So the idea is we could get better about how we train people as yeah. opposed to. But maybe I will answer. I, I, I think that people need to change. I think they are already changing, but uh, you know you need to change to hey, life is you know uh, you need a continual learning, and continually evolve and change yourself. It's not the case that you go to college, get an education, learn how to do a particular task, and that's it. 
you know, the, the, the world is different today. You need to think differently about it and, and, um, and continually grow. But my, my guess is, is that um, robots uh, will create more jobs than they take away. Uh, and the standard of living will go up, and people will be doing more human things versus mechanical things. Mm. Deepak, yeah, so, uh, robots, what, what's going to happen to cooks? <laughs> I get asked this question a lot. Uh, and my perspective on this has changed as, uh, uh, as our robots being deployed more. I learned a, a bunch of counterintuitive things as we've deployed our robots in the field more and more. So the way our robot works is uh, someone needs to prep the ingredients before, they load it inside the robot, uh, and then the robot dispenses everything. So it's kind of like a salad bar where you already prep it and you put it in there. So compared to a salad bar, uh, the labor is pretty similar. But one of the things we learned, uh, uh, which we never expected, we found out convenience stores are a huge market for us. Because convenience stores are losing tobacco revenue in a big way right now because of legislation, and they want, to repl they want to bring fresh food into their stores. And now, with convenience stores, they don't have labor there right now, uh, so they can't afford labor. They want food 24-7. It's tailor-made for robots. And I never expected that when I started the company. Uh, and so you have all these convenience stores who want to put the uh, robot in there, and someone needs to prep the ingredients somewhere, in a kitchen somewhere else, so you're actually adding jobs there. Uh, you're adding jobs for people to go and take the uh, ingredients from the kitchen, from the commissary kitchen into these uh, uh, convenience stores. So there's 100,000 convenience stores out there for someday going to use robots, and they're going to add new jobs for people prepping the ingredients and delivering them to the stores and refilling them. <laughs> so I never expected this to happen. Uh, so. That's, and that's one thing you see always with automation. Uh, it always creates new markets, new jobs, uh, which you didn't expect to happen. For example, when ATMs first came in, people uh, thought, you know, these ATMs are going to take away all the teller jobs. But if you looked at what's happened in the past 20 years, the ATM actually reduced the cost of setting up a new bank branch because you needed far fewer tellers. And the number of bank branches went up quite a bit. So you actually have uh, the ATMs did not uh, cost a ton of bank jobs. The number of bank jobs has actually gone up. So uh, I think we'll always have to keep an eye out for these new markets which robots enable, and we need to go after them as well. Now, with robots, the other thing to consider is robots have a bunch of advantages compared to humans, and cost is just one of them. Uh, for, for our robot, for example, you have benefits in terms of health and wellness and hygiene. And robots, our robots are available 24-7, something you can't get from a human. And as a company, we made a conscious decision to go after markets where you gain from the benefits of robots, like the 24-7 availability or the health. And we don't want to go after labor cost reduction opportunities. So, and so as a company, we want to do good to the world. We want to make people healthy. We don't want to cost jobs. And there's enough robot uh, applications out there where we can make plenty of money without costing jobs, and they're going after those. Are you trading cigarettes for salad? Yeah, that's better, isn't it? Like, that makes it sound good. There's a, an interesting angle around this that comes up over and over in the new robotics businesses that I talk to, which is you start with a really direct analog where it's going to make the salad and it's starting in shops where there's a person that's making the salad and that shop is selling the salad. But as it rolls out, it becomes a, and then what? And it moves into <coughs> new shop areas or a new value is discovered around the process. So for example, Savio, the hotel delivery robot, discovered that while the delivery was advantageous, the real reason that hotel chains want that robot is that it inserts a point of customer service in a very satisfactory, subtle way that allows the hospitality uh, purveyors to make sure that someone's happy in a way that you couldn't do personally, but it allowed you to have one more point of contact mm. and ensure satisfaction. So it turns out to be that and then value that is the critical value. But you started with a really direct analog. Well, you no longer have room <laughs> service, let us have a, a, a robot to replace room service. Now, 
the things that I think about with Sally are some of the things that we talked about around the democratization of expert surgery with surgical robots, mm -hmm. so that you could have effectively the asurgical team guiding and training robots in surgery, and then that could be available to every person. I think, um, again, we think about what are the strengths of AI and robotics? The ability to filter and collect and sort a lot of information more than the average person could ever do, and the ability to do it quickly and repetitively, do mundane things. So it's quite handy for surgery, also quite handy for making salads. Now, how many of us have a particular food preference or allergy or choice, and you have a very unsatisfactory discussion? You know, are there eggs in this? I don't know. I'll go ask the kitchen. Or just complete, you know, crap. Oh, no. And you're like, it looks like egg. Oh, no, no idea. <laughs> you know, this is something where you will get a, an individualized and highly precise version of your diet in a way that, you know, already our shops are filling up with the kale salad with chicken, the endamami come Asian, the this, but I don't want soy because that's bad for me and I want this. I'm getting really finicky about the things that I want. And now we're able to start to get that highly precise and individualized serviced. And on a flip side, we can apply that to agriculture as well. And we've had the technological revolution of agriculture, which was the tractor in 1910. Then we had the chemical revolution of agriculture. But one of the biggest things that robotics, AI, and computer vision technology can do to <coughs> agriculture is the precision agriculture revolution, where we don't treat an entire field for everything. We treat only those plants that need it. So we reduce the toxins that go into our food chain, we increase the abundance of that food chain, and we reduce the energy. Let me come back. I, I want to pull on a thread that, that, that Bruce mentioned before, and it, it's an idea that um, you know, economists like Eric Brynjolfsson and uh, Ajay Agarwal talk a, a lot about, which is as these technologies um, reduce the cost of certain things, that increases the demand for the complements of what the machines are doing. And so, for instance, you know, the ability you know, for, for a machine to do inventory allows greater demand for other people in the store to do other activities. I'd love to hear whether or not there are other examples that come to mind when you think about your own products and services and experiences that you have with the technology coming into play and perhaps actually creating more demand for human labor you know, <coughs> in adjacent spaces. Deepak. So uh, one of the things we've seen in our deployments is they, they used to sell these box salads before. And once we put the robot in there, since you could customize your salad and you could get exactly what you wanted from it, uh, people started buying a lot more salads. Uh, we, we found uh, people buy three times more salads. And they start thinking of salads as a snack. So we never expected to sell salads at 8 in the morning. But people, once they see the side salad is $2, instead of buying the bag of chips uh, from uh, uh, the vending machine, they go and start eating salads. They end up healthier. We've had people eat salads at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the evening. So uh, you actually create de more demand for salads. We were selling three times as many salads. And so someone needs to prep all those ingredients. And so it's creating new uh, jobs in those places as well. I think one example is, uh, you know, we talked earlier, Bruce, you mentioned briefly about people going to college, but recent studies have shown that sort of, you know, for the marginal student trying to go and get a four-year degree, the returns aren't there for them. They're more likely to drop out, having spent a lot of time and effort, and then not getting a job in that area. What's kind of missing is that a lot of these highly skilled machines need highly skilled people to then service and work with those machines. And that's creating a, a cadre of, of work where you have machine operators, robot programmers, there's an awful lot of tending to these highly sophisticated machines that is the source of some very nicely paid, but also increasingly skilled labor. And increasingly less skilled because a lot of it is really just, can you plug it back in? Someone unplugged it. 
can you go and make sure it's plugged in? But there's actually, well, in the industrial space, the time to set up, for example, a new manufacturing plant with robots can be up to a year. So you can spend a year getting all the robots configured just so you can start production. So that's a significant task. And what's a little bit missing, especially in this country, is we've traditionally channeled everybody for education through a community college, four-year college. The vocational side, like how does a person who doesn't want to get a four-year degree become a skilled mechanic and a skilled craftsperson? And that sort of withered. We had it in the pre-industrial age. It was called an apprentice. You, you became indentured to someone. You, you became a blacksmith or something else. And sorcerer. <laughs> sorcerer, maybe. <laughs> maybe in McKinsey, you do magic. But, uh, but this notion of like, and we see that in particular, like when you look at certain countries, there's often a sort of an unemployment bulge among the young, right? Higher rates of unemployment among people 18 to whatever. But in countries that have really good apprenticeship programs for technical work, such as in Germany or Switzerland and others, the unemployment rate, uh, rate among the young, in Switzerland, for example, where ABB is based, it's around 3%. So there's actually no effective unemployment because there's multiple channels. And I think that's the other part, is as we start thinking about these machines and the kind of care that they need, there will be jobs that require a certain level of specialization, but it may not be a four-year degree in a classic university sense. So talk a little bit about this, because it sounds like the new jobs that are being created require higher skills. I mean, Andre, you mentioned sometimes it requires lower skills, because the technology actually does the high-skilled stuff. You know, what, what is it that... Um, you know, can you take someone who is, you know, coming off the line because the robot's coming in, you know, I in a cage it, or not, and then actually train them for this higher skill? It's yes and yes, rather than yeah, no, because there are more higher skill jobs being created, but there are also some more alternatives to current education. I think if we wait for education to fix the problems, it's going to be way too late. Yeah. And because of this, we're seeing the rise of MOOCs and online training courses and nano degrees. Yeah. I think we should. I'd love to see more apprenticeships. I do think the technical college model in Europe is, is definitely highly effective. But one of the things is, it used to be a master mechanic had years of knowledge to pull from. Now there's a lot of Google a lot of uh, examples online, and I think that our interface technologies can make a lot of thing, jobs that were highly skilled yes. much simpler. Yes. So through the use of AR, through the use of Google, there are many, I fixed my washing machine myself, and all I needed was Google, you know? Right. Um, well, it, I, you know, I, I think about it, it it's mostly uh, with robotics, it's like we're giving the human another power tool. So. Maybe before there was electric motor, you had to always saw your wood with a hand saw. Now we're giving, giving people a power tool. And so and that frees up a lot of human potential to do other things. And uh, it's just like you know everybody would have thought ATMs were gonna lower the number of jobs in banking, but uh, no, it didn't. And, and I, I think it's very hard for us to think about what happens next because we're all consumed with the way society is today, but historically, technology for the last couple hundred years has just created more and more jobs, and people are not doing all these labor-intensive or things that the humans aren't particularly good at. Uh, I think it will just free up the human potential to do more interesting, creative things, and it's not necessarily higher education, but it's things that humans do well, and, and humans are very different than robots. Yeah, uh, if you look at jobs 20 years from now, right, I see them falling in two main categories. One category needs more education. Uh, the second category uh, deals with interacting with people. And I'll talk about both of them, right? So uh, one, one thing people ask me a lot about is how restaurant, uh, uh, how restaurant employment is going to look 20 years from now. So uh, there are some jobs in restaurants which can which I don't believe will ever get automated. So for example, in a restaurant, right, you got tons of servers. And with servers, uh, uh, being able to talk with uh, servers uh, are, uh, it, it's a job which needs a lot of human skill. You need to be good with people. If I uh, go for an anniversary dinner with my wife to a restaurant, 
I don't want to be greeted by a robot who doesn't understand my Indian accent. <laughs> <laughs> so Siri still doesn't understand me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so those types of jobs, I see them being humans uh, for a long time. We've taken a number of surveys of restaurant owners, and they tell us they want humans serving all the time. Uh, but if you look inside the kitchen, you've got two types of jobs. You've got the lower skill jobs. There are some people who just chop up vegetables all day. And I don't know how they can do that, but those are the kinds of jobs the robots will take. Uh, but there are other jobs, like the head chef or uh, other chefs, uh, where you need skill and you need creativity. And those are going to be humans for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I guess one uh, point I'm trying to make here is uh, if people focus on jobs which involve interfacing with other humans, they're always going to be relevant. And the second type of jobs is, as you see more and more robots and automation and AI. Uh, having a good education is a very helpful tool to have because you'll be able to access a lot of these jobs. Uh, so that's, why, that's one reason why I believe the education system in the US needs to improve. It needs to uh, be much less expensive. And I think we are seeing steps in that direction from the private sector. Uh, for example, one of the things I like doing now, I'm trying to learn more and more about cooking. So I take culinary classes online. And I just do it uh, on the weekend. And I know, know a lot more about it than I did a few months back. And it cost me almost nothing. Uh, so I think you're going to see more and more of this kind of thing where people learn new skills by themselves. And uh, they get better and better. That was going to be my question, Deepak. Don't you think that you said more education, but is it also, or maybe not instead of more education, is it agility in learning? Because um, just a personal anecdote, my daughter went uh, last summer and she was working at uh, um, electric car company in Fremont, and uh, she was put on the assembly line, and uh, she came home and she was really frustrated because she goes, yeah, daddy, I mean, they basically gave me a computer, and they put me in front of where they make the electric motors, and they said, this machine is defective, and she goes like, and? She goes, well, find out what's wrong with it, and she goes, how do I do that? Go to YouTube, uh, figure it out, and it's like, you know, you have to write something in Python. And she goes, I don't know Python. Go to YouTube, right? And so it was this. But after a week, she figured it out. And so I think this agility and learning, that doesn't necessarily correspond with a four-year degree either. But how does our educational system evolve to such a point where we, I don't know, teach people to be agile, teach people how to think, or how to decompose problems, or reassemble solutions? Though I don't think we need to worry too much yet. I, I believe that is in the future, because I think our machine capabilities will improve over time, but I like to call at the moment what we have artificial stupidity, <laughs> not artificial intelligence, because there is no common sense, there is no generalization, and there's no context. So I think one of the biggest jobs that's left is not just creativity and human connection, it's common sense. Mm. It's when the vegetable chopper runs out of vegetables and starts chopping something else that accidentally got left there, when the server tries to send the same meals to the wrong table, when there's mix-ups, and you don't need to ask how that happened. Was, was it machine error or human error? It sort of doesn't matter. Those are things that humans are incredibly good at dealing with. It's an agility, but it's not something that requires additional skill. It's like, oh, that's a problem. That's clear to me. It is certainly not clear to our artificial stupidity. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come to the audience questions in a moment. But I, I want to pull on another thread that Deepak mentioned, which is what are the things that either people will always do or are going to continue to do for a while in the workplace? Because is there anything that machines won't eventually be able to do? I think uh, Deepak and Andrea mentioned it. So one, one element is context. So I think what we see the machines doing really well is task-based automation. But uh, another anecdote, I think most jobs will be sort of computer or machine-assisted in some way. Take medicine, right? So diagnosing a patient, probably the computer could do better than most, most doctors. Treating that patient with surgery, micro, so pigeon? Yeah, pigeons can be trained to detect cancer on radio. Um, okay, well, I'll leave the pigeon to you. But because uh, they have really good eyesight. Yes. So it's about recognizing the fact that pigeons have much better eyesight than people. True. But for example, one thing that, uh, <laughs> no, getting back to the main story. Um, 
I think the one thing that, for example, it's well known that, for example, the elderly, they get lonely, they want to go talk to the nice man in the white coat, so they go and talk to the doctor, and you know, the doctor knows after a while that Mrs. Jones really has nothing seriously wrong with her, but she likes to come in every couple of weeks and just have a chat with the nice man in the white coat. Well, if you were a automaton, you would be describing, okay, maybe it's dengue fever now, maybe it's malaria now, let's get, I mean, you would be stuffing poor Mrs. Jones full of pills, but a human being would know like, yeah, she's old and she likes to have a chat and you know, it's harmless and I do that. So context, right? So I think that context, relating to people I agree with as well, but I think it's that human judgment and context that guides the different stages of the automation. There's also uh, morality. You know, we talk a bit about ethics, and I believe that most systems, we have a process for proving that they can perform better and better. And it's, no stra it's not a strange thing for us to accept that machines can do better than humans once we've proven that and accept the range within which they operate. But we have a legal system because we believe that a human judgment is really part of the social contract in which we're all bound. And so there are so many things where in medicine, AI and robotics can do many things better, but there has to be a doctor involved in the treatment. And I like that the medical field has a clear understanding of that. And mm. I think we're gonna be raising that issue in many, many other fields. Where do we need to have a human hand in the process? And where are we just used to having it? and it's not actually necessary or good. Bruce, is there a set of things that? Well, I think entertainment and comedy <laughs> would be <laughs> difficult for a machine to do. Um, um, actually, I think uh, machines could be very good in doing education. Um, um, uh, it's often, but I, I think in general change, but um, you know, I. I I find this a difficult question to answer because um, you're just, just like, you know, I would have thought for sure, um, you know, ATM machines were gonna uh, make less jobs, right? But I, but I think as this, it's very hard to look out 10 years. I, I think that it, we have a, another, you know, layer of automation, uh, society will advance and there'll be always a new frontier. So sort of as a circle of knowledge expands the circumference of of the unknown uh, increases. Uh, uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I think we just continually advance as a society. And so just like the people were scared to death of, of automation and farms and losing their jobs, what are they gonna do if they don't have a job on a farm? Um, people are scared today with what is this automation gonna do to their future? But so far, you know, historically, you know, all kinds of new opportunities open up and so it's hard to answer. Um, it's hard to think three or four years out. You know, I would never have thought Facebook could be a business. Right? It makes it made no sense to me when uh, that got started, and even when it had its sixty billion dollar valuation. Right? Uh, uh, but you know, it's one of the most valuable companies today. Turns so, out, in the long run, you were right about because actually, teller employment has started coming down finally. So right. yeah. Let's open it up uh, to people in the room. Are there questions? There are mics on their way. There are lots to talk about here. There are a couple of questions here. Hey, Blair Henley Frank from VentureBeat. Um, one of the things that I hear come up in a lot of future of work and automation conversations is that humans will get to do more of the work uh, that we do really well because we're human, because we care, because we have some amount of creativity or abstraction that isn't well performed by robots. What does that mean for a society that seems to fairly consistently undervalue the sorts of emotional and creative labor that we're saying humans do really well right now? That is a, actually a point about women and work because the majority of these things that we call the human touch tend to be female labor, and it tends to be the lowest paid labor out. And so I think you've hit on a really interesting point there. Anything else? Sorry? Fixing dryer. Fixing dryer. I know where to Google that now. 
<laughs> well, these days, my mother actually just emailed me. She said, I cleared the whole house. Their dryer was playing up. And she said, I thought it was going to be really big, but I thought the dryer's really clever because it told me what the problem was and told me who to call. So I did, and they came, and they replaced it, and it was, it was like boom, boom, boom. Uh, and we take this for granted now. You know, the dryer tells you what the problem is and who to call. I don't know if I agree with the statement that we undervalue the uh, human touch because my sales guy makes a lot more money than I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're the CEO, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, what, one other quick comment uh, to Guido's, you know, looking around the world, there are different places where caring professions and other um, uh, occupations, uh, those places have decided to pay those, you know, occupations more because they value them more. So it's, it's not universally necessarily the case. In fact, it was shown that teachers in, was it Finland? It's a, the hardest profession to get into. Yes. You require the highest marks, and it has the longest degree training, and it is paid very, very highly. It has the best performing educational system in terms of outcomes for students, and it hasn't had to reduce class sizes. So I came from Australia, where we're reducing class size all the time, but teaching is notoriously an easy profession to get into. So there's heaps of teachers, let's keep reducing class size. Outcomes did not improve. So I believe that the example of valuing and paying highly for the social skills that we need needs to be, we need to do more of that. Next question. Well, I, I work in politics. Um, some of the changes you suggest to make this a, a productive shift in society um, are going to require a great deal of political will, filling yeah. the gaps in the social uh, safety net. And I have to confess, I don't often see the tech industries at those hearings. Mm -hmm. Is there you know, an intention to use its considerable resources and influence um, to make those changes happen amongst yourself, your peers in the industry? Yeah. So uh, it's not a really a question, but I'll respond to it anyway. <laughs> the, um, so we, did, we have firsthand experience with this. So as ABB uh, a couple of years ago found itself at a 150 odd thousand people worldwide uh, decided because of margin pressures that we had to slim down. So essentially several thousand people impacted in, for example, in Germany, as we had to close down some of our facilities. We had a choice to make. We had, uh, on the one hand, we could lay people off and pay them a severance package. Or on the other hand, we could also help retrain. And so working with the unions, working with labor, being able to come up with an agreement to say, look, you know what, if we work on retraining, then this could be done with you as opposed to something that's done to you. And we chose that second path. And that was something which, I think it's a little bit depending on the relationship also between not just government and companies, but also between companies and the unions. And what we see particularly in some uh, smaller uh, countries in Europe, for example, is there isn't quite the adversarial relationship between the employer and the union as there often is, for example, here in this country. And as a result, a lot of the unions are actually trying to get ahead of this whole problem of skills training and how to make sure their workforce remains relevant. And I think you know, we might wish that that be the case, but we have what we have. But I think there's probably a, a need for a greater dialogue, how we engender that. I think it's true that maybe some of the sort of pure software companies don't necessarily think that they are maybe relevant to this debate, but we have 275 factories worldwide. We employ a lot of blue collar workers. We have all kinds of people in all kinds of places. So we've firsthand experience of trying to do this. But I do think I take your point. Uh, this is something that tech needs to lean into because it is causing some of this change as well. And just to be clear, ABB retrained workers for jobs that were outside of e yes. ABB. Yes, that's interesting. Okay. By the way, back to your previous point about apprenticeships. Just ye uh, yesterday, the Markle Skillful Initiative announced uh, you know, a network of, of 20 governors uh, who are interested in, in applying skills-based uh, training and, and, and apprenticeships. Um, next question. Hello. Hi, I'm Marie from Accenture. Uh, I'm curious, you mentioned it a little bit, some of you with the learning agility, um, but as we're moving over implementing more robotics and AI, what do you see as the top three things that employees need to embrace and leaders need to reinforce to ensure the transition and the culture mindset change goes smoothly? Top three. Deepak? 
Yeah, so one of the things, uh, uh, we've got three or four cultural values in our company which we hold dear, and one of them is keep improving all the time. And so uh, everyone in our company, we've, uh, we all have access to lynda.com where we can you know, take a number of classes and make ourselves better. Uh, so I, I think that, that part is crucial. Uh, uh, irrespective of whether you lose your job or not, you gotta keep getting better all the time. And we gotta enforce that. Uh, in, in terms of the education system itself, uh, it needs to evolve to a system where you don't, you don't just learn uh, something, you learn how to learn. Uh, and that was something we discussed before as well. So I, I think uh, trying to get better all the time and building that culture is key. Bruce, is there a thing? Or? Yeah, I'm not sure how to, to answer the question, but I mean, the, one of the interesting things about this software is that uh, we have to employ lots of humans because the software has to be educated and trained just like people, and so we have uh, large numbers of humans in the loop, um, and um, so um, you know, let's say we're, we're training it to, to uh, you know identify where the labels are are doing reading. There are uh, humans in the loop, um, you know, um, you know uh, creating the data sets and training the software. Um, and so it, um, it's it's not like a piece of code you write and it works. Uh, and every time we go into a new store or you know a, a different chain or, or whatever, um, uh, the the computers have to go to school just like uh, um, uh, uh, people do. So um, it's not really answering your question, but um, it, it it's just interesting that it, it creates a a whole new kind of uh, workforce out there. So we have a lot of people in India doing the human in the loop. Um, for example. Andrew Guido, or we can go to another question. Uh, I think one of the most important values, and it's the, it's, the, it's the hardest one, it's one of the key ethical guidelines when we look at robotics and AI, and it's transparency. Because when things are kept in black boxes, when it's always somebody else's responsibility, then not only do incredible negative uh, eventual results happen, uh, but no one is empowered to take responsibility and no one is empowered to learn and to develop ownership. Next question. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Alex Hansen, uh, undergraduate student at the University of San Francisco. And I had a question concerning about the relation to, you know, uh, average person uh, getting interested in doing robotics, um, you know, AI, and why not having uh, programs directly from these businesses or these tech companies sure. or like internships that any average person can be interested in so that you directly fill those jobs and have those uh, as, as, you know, interested wanting to learn so that it's yeah. not just open and just there. Yeah. You have those who want the job and is completely interested and would love it that are students, business, computer science, whatever, can also attain and learn this information directly from them rather than only just putting it out there. Yeah. Anybody uh, taking resumes? <laughs> <laughs> we are. I, I we have a chat. Everyone in robotics is hiring. Yes. And I think I'll, if I can fill in a little bit before Guido answers this, you've got to understand that the 50 years of industrial robotics has led to an industry, the largest aspect of the robotics industry, where I believe there's an annual turnaround of 3 billion or 30 billion? 30 billion, I think, these days. But when you talk about the tech industry, you're not talking about us, okay? The majority of robotics companies ABB is one of the giants. The rest are fewer than 30 employees or pre-Series A stage. I did the figures for investment in robotics companies and in 2016, in 2015, we hit a milestone and there was $1 billion invested in robotics companies that year. Well, let's put that into context. That was the same amount of money that was invested into food ordering apps. Okay, so when you talk about the tech industry, that's not robotics. 
okay? We're such a small frog still in this big tech pond where you've got your, even though Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, yep. Salesforce, everybody else is doing robotics to an extent, the actual innovation part of this is so tiny and it makes it difficult to be part of policy groups. And in terms of putting classes on, we actually rely on um, foresightful other parties like Udacity or uh, university lecturers who put out free open source classes. And there are a number of those MOOCs that are absolutely fantastic. Or you get a third party course like Udacity that says, we can see that there's a growing need here for an industry that's going to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger that is not going to be serviced by the educational industry as it stands. Mm. So we will leap in and do this. Uh, so I'm volunteering to speak on behalf of all of those companies that have raised at best a million or two dollars and have only a handful of employees. Um, and I think you can speak about how you actually, I mean, I've been in Switzerland, it's ABB everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so actually, we, we, do, uh, we do this. For example, in uh, North Carolina, which is where we have a fairly significant presence, we have worked with the local um, technical university system there. And uh, we have 70,000 students who have access to our robots. And we've contributed courseware so that people can get trained how to configure and program robots. Um, but there again, I'm also even bullish on the fact that today this is limited by physical access, right? You need to access a robot to be able to learn how to use it. And there's stuff coming, like for example, one of the solutions we have is called Robot Studio. You can actually simulate a robot assembly line. So you have a computer, you can now design an entire assembly line full of robots, and you can program them, make sure that they're doing the right thing, and then when you're happy with that, you can download that to a real robot if you happen to have one. So I think that's how we scaled the education. But I think before that, maybe the question behind the question, or maybe what Andrea was also alluding to, is, um, I'm, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this topic. It's, I think we need to attract a lot more people into these kinds of professions. And what I think is the, one of the tragedies of our education system is like, you know, being the father of two uh, daughters who are now in college, they had no idea what the job prospects or the job market were, were for any role or position they wanted to choose. And I try to guide them in terms of, yep, we're going to need a lot more industrial engineers and a lot more uh, mechanical engineers, which is what both of them are. But it's, it's one of those things where how do young people know what the career prospects are of certain disciplines? And I'm very bullish on robotics. I think it's going to be a great place to work. So hopefully that's oh, your profession. Robotics and medicine, if you're a lawyer, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Lawyers are toast, but um, no, aside from that, I mean, look, it's a great suggestion. We're trying to do that as we can. Um, definitely more work required, but uh, it's a great area. Uh, you always have entry-level jobs in any robotics company, which someone who is not skilled at robotics can get into. For example, in our company, right, I've got people who have almost no skills uh, uh, in terms of technical skills or... <laughs> <laughs> In terms of technical skills, or, uh, sales skills, or marketing skills, uh, we just bring them into customer service, uh, and Is then that the, not we a skill. <laughs> uh, well, if uh, let's just say work experience, maybe. Uh, but so we've got other entry-level jobs. Uh, for example, we've got some people doing ingredient testing whose job all day is to make salads and eat them. So. <laughs> You don't need many skills to do that. You just have to uh, press the button a few times. So, yeah, uh, uh, there you are. So, um, I did kind of wonder when you were learning how to cook on YouTube how you could tell if it tasted right. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Bruce. Um, so, um, I mean, we've been hiring pretty rapidly about 50 jobs in the last six months, and probably 150 jobs this year, and, and have a half a dozen interns, uh, usually. So. Resumes. All right, what's, who's next? Yeah. So you all seem to have a fairly optimistic view of how this all plays out for society. I, I know you're not futurist, but let's say it's 2030, to use Michael's point in time, and this, the consensus is that this has had a negative effect on society. What went wrong? I think if it's had a really negative effect, we're not talking about consensus, we're talking about revolution. You know, I, I think that's one of the things. We have it in our power 
to make a lot of change in the world. And I'm an optimist because <coughs> on the whole, we've been heading towards a civilization that solves problems through consensus, not bloodshed. But I think that if we really stuff things up, it will go backwards. And nobody really wants that. So I think we're all fairly incentivized to keep things moving in a, a positive direction. Yeah, I, I think if, if it has a really negative effect, say on GDP or, or whatever, you know, then you would quit investing in this direction. Uh, oh, society, or people in general, right? Well, um, it, um, you know, um, what went wrong? Um, you know, I guess I, I, I can't answer that without more specifics. <laughs> um, but, um, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, I've just, you know, in my um, 50 years of uh, life or whatever, um, it's been a constant, everybody's always so worried about the future, but, you know, as I look at the world, uh, uh, it's far better than it was in the 70s, uh, you know, uh, you know, far safer. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, you know, I haven't seen the negative impact of, of technology to date. So, you know, maybe all of a sudden computers are getting, are replacing people, but, you know, when I look at, at the nature of this software, um, you know, humans are tr training it to do a particular task, but it's really not replacing a human. Um, you know, it doesn't have feelings or, uh, you know, um, there has to be an economic reason for, for doing it. And, and to be an economic reason, it has to be something people want, right? Um, so, you know, maybe it's different today, um, but uh, I think it, it's sort of the nature of humans to, to fear the future. Instead of asking what went wrong, I would ask what could go wrong in the next 20 years. Uh, uh, one thing which could go wrong is uh, it's a capitalistic world right now. Jobs are going to go to the places where people work the hardest, where people get the most work done. And it could be that in some countries, if uh, they're moving towards uh, four day uh, we uh, weeks of work, then you're going to have less jobs there compared to some place else where you got six, where people work six days a week. So uh, I think that's one thing which could go wrong, where the distribution of work could be more in certain countries versus others. And that's one thing we'll have to worry about. I'm going to mention two things, just to take the privilege. Uh, one is, if we don't figure out how to retrain people at scale successfully past the first two decades of life, that'll be a problem. And then, um, depending on where the gains from all these brilliant machines go to, we could see increasing inequality, and that could also be an issue. What's next? Who else has a mic? That was actually a perfect lead into my question. So, uh, Scott Move from Microsoft. So, what, we've talked a fair amount about the number of jobs, we've talked somewhat about the quality of jobs but we really haven't talked about the equity here. So it comes back shortly to what we, the first question on how we, who, what type of work we value, somewhat the political side. You know, so what is it that the robotics industry, we the tech industry, educators, regulators, business owners, what do we need to be doing to make sure all these wonderful gains you've talked about are equitably distributed across society? You know, I, I think there's a bit of a, I think an implied direction of this, which is that the robot makers are going to make out like bandits, and it's going to be fantastic in terms of creating all this wealth. Uh, you know, it would be, uh, I don't see that, uh, because I think it, there's no signs that that is necessarily the case. There's plenty of competition, lots and lots of people making tools. Um, but I do think, and it's maybe different, because I think we're kind of projecting sort of a winner takes all mentality on this robot landscape, which I don't think works the same way as it does for some online systems, uh, for example. But I think in general, if I just take the premise of how do we make sure that we don't have people left behind. One of the things that, again, I'm gonna go back to the social contract, but I think it's a combination. It's a three-way system of education, 
employers and government. And I think it really is this combination because if we end up producing millions of people with skills that nobody wants to pay for, then somebody somewhere sent the wrong signal to say like these are not the kind of workers, employers that, that we need, right? So I think, or employees that we need. I think in the case of companies, having people in the street with pitchforks trying to scream for the heads of the bosses of these companies <laughs> isn't also conducive to prosperity and everything else, right? So we wanna try and have a system whereby we have plenty of people available to do the jobs that we would like to pay them to do and there, uh, thereby we would prosper. Yeah, I, I think it, both of these questions are, are very, very similar. And the increasing disparity, the inequality of the distribution of wealth is fundamentally the biggest problem that I believe we face. Mm -hmm. Although shortage of food and food security is kind of right up there with that as well. But this is where I'm saying, I believe that it's a little bit, uh, as much as it's a major problem, it's also p potentially self-corrective because the 1% won't survive if they make the rest of the 99% too hungry. So there is a little bit of measure there. But I, I do strongly, um, I think that Piketty is definitely on the track where one of the issues now is not labor capital. issue, it's the shift of labor to capital and what we do about that. But I think that there is also some really interesting opportunities there. And right at the start, Michael said a very interesting statistic, which is that for all of us here, 50% of what we do each day is probably going to be automated. And I thought, which 50%? Okay, 50% of what I do all day at work is not necessarily work, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest. How much of our work time do we spend playing words with friends, looking at the news headlines, maybe checking on our stock portfolio or our Kiva loans, whichever it might be, or um, just sending a few messages, even theoretically amongst our work colleagues, or heaven help us if it's a boring job, then we are catching up on the latest serial or doing other things while we're working. So I think that this is a very underlooked thing. We talk about education as the way that we're gonna solve this problem. I think we're smart enough to do really interesting interaction. And the online game industry is now wealthier than the movie industry. What about we turn work into something that we would pay to do because it's so much fun, you know? At the moment, if you tell someone, let's re-educate you or retrain you, it's like, oh God, do I have to? What if it's, you know, we want you to eat salad all day or play these really cool games? And I think that's an interesting way to look at it for the youth who have been very disenfranchised from technology. Because what do they aspire to do? They aspire to play sports or these days to play video games because the online game community or to make music. Now, these are digital interactions in the large part that we can perhaps be more creative about how we reincorporate that and maybe make all work something that's pleasant mm. rather than something that you suffer through. I mean, don't we think that work is something that you don't like? Next question. Hi, I'm Christine and I work in security. Um, so question about what could go wrong. We have um, robots for security too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, like it, but. Um, well, we live in a world where there's a marketplace for security vulnerabilities. And so I'm curious just to hear about like, you know, what are the safeguards that each of your companies are putting in place to, um, you know, s secure the robots that will one day be alongside humans? Yeah, it's a great, uh, great question. In fact, it's one that definitely concerns us because as we've seen with things like Stuxnet, right? So for a long time, the industrial world kind of assumed that viruses and cyber hacks were a problem for IT. But in fact, it's often the industrial equipment that's the oldest and the most vulnerable and could also potentially cause some real harm if it's not properly protected. So it's, uh, as chief digital officer for ABB, I worry about this quite a bit. Uh, it's partly my job on the line if this uh, isn't going well for ABB, so uh, I'm motivated. But 
it's a, a particular thing that we focus on with all of the latest technologies that are available, but it's also, in some sense, a never-ending arms race. As you know, this isn't, there's no perfect security. Um, it's always a question of degree, and frankly, the weakest link in the chain is often the person working the machine. Yeah, I, I think one of the things about robotics is that it is simply enterprise software on wheels. You know, so a lot of the problems that we face, we've already kind of, I won't say solved, but we know how we go about solving them and we know where the issues are. Perhaps it raises an interesting kind of extra question because um, I think in many ways open source is quite a good way to keep ahead of that arms race, like have as many people as possible trying to find your weaknesses helps you protect against them. But you do run into a different uh, equation when that weakness might be with a 50 pound swinging metal object. But on the other hand, software controls elevators and other things like that. So, you know, hey, does anyone remember the year 2K, Y2K bug? Okay. Well, we thought planes were going to fall out of the sky then, right. but um, <laughs> hmm. right. still on the table. I mean, actually, it's a big part of the design of our robot because if, if we ever have an incident where a robot ran into a person, you know, or, or harmed anybody, um, so a big part of our design are secure our systems to identify all the people and and fail, you know, fail safe to because we can never afford to have with a robot, much like a self-driving car, um, you know, this extremely challenging problem, uh, that environment. Uh, so before you can really let these things out, um, they have to be very safe. Yeah, safety and security, uh, they're pretty important for us as well, because if you're putting food into someone's body, then it needs to be really safe. Uh, so we had to design our robots so there were no sharp corners where bacteria could accumulate and all and uh, it cost us a year or a year and a half just to do that. Uh, and e even in terms of payment, uh, uh, having good secure card reader systems, uh, that's one of the key parts of our sales cycle. So yeah, it's something uh, which impacts us, our business quite a bit. No salad hacks. Poisoning is up there amongst the top five or six causes of death in the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go figure. All right, it's time for the lightning round. You guys ready? Quick questions, quick answers. Feel free to pass if you don't like them. Guido, I'm starting with you. For what occupation would you be most worried about robotics automating its activities? For um, miners. Andra. Robotics automation. Uh, according to one of the most recent economic studies, it's going to be fashion models. Bruce. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, a lawyer. <laughs> No. <laughs> Prep cooks? Yeah. All right. For what occupation are you least worried about robotics automating at activities? Deepak? Chefs. Uh, I guess inventory. So. Fashion models. <laughs> I was going to say fashion models. Pass. <laughs> uh, what significant technical limitation of robotics is the general business audience least aware of? Guido. Battery power. Stupid. Just stupid. Uh -huh. Well, you Bruce. took my uh, you um, the same one. Yeah, I, I would. I would have said power system. <laughs> yeah, everyone thinks robots are going to be perfect. They work all the time. Robots take sick time off too. <laughs> you said they didn't. You said twenty-four seven. All right. <laughs> what application of robotics is most likely to accelerate and surprise people? Deepak. Uh, I would say uh, babysitting. Bruce. Uh, um, I guess, you know, 3D imaging of the world around us. Andre? Uh, I think perhaps recognizing us, because they're not very good at that yet. But I think there's a strong push to be better at personalizing and understanding a person's context, because that's the key to our wallet. Guido? Quality control. If you could solve one problem around the future of work, what, it would, what would it be, Guido? The transition, the impact of people that are impacted by technology, like how do we help the people directly impacted? Andra. Pay us for having fun instead of us, uh, you, you know, I think we should be heading to a consumer society. Bruce. Uh, improving education. Deepak. Yeah, a low cost education system. 
What's your favorite source of information to keep abreast of developments in robotics and the future of work? Deepak. Uh, I like TechCrunch. Um, just going to work every day, I guess. <laughs> that too. Under. Robohub.org. And podcasts. What television show or mu movie has your favorite depiction of people living or working alongside machines? Guido. Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> so many. Um, I, I'm going ex machina. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass. <laughs> uh, the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. What television show or movie has your least favorite depiction of people living or working alongside machines? Deepak. Uh, so, Blade Runner. <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. Um, Westworld. Wally. Oh. <laughs> Wally, yeah. That's good Given the changing future of work, what would you advise a high school student going to college to study? Robotics. Robotics. Uh, whatever their passion is. Yeah, robotics. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't answering Bruce's question, were you? Okay, uh, finally, what one piece of advice would you have for the people in this room? Deepak. Uh, just keep uh, learning new things and getting better all the time. You'll, you'll never uh, have to worry about your jobs. Bruce. Uh, change um, uh, creates opportunity. Andrew. And that we can make things change. We all have the power to do that. Yeah. Focus on the macro, not the micro. Please thank our panel. Thank you very much. We know you have lots of choices for how to spend your evening. We appreciate that you came out to spend it with us tonight. As a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Next time, Michael Chewy, we're going to have to bring in a chest of drawers for you, <laughs> for yours. Thank you very much. Uh, a recording of this, this uh, program will be available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel within a couple of days, where you will find recordings of most of our other programs as well. We hope that you find that to be a useful resource. Our next program is next week, the morning of the 22nd, with Go to Market with Paul Weefels, who's here with us in the audience, and Andy Cunningham. Hope you can join us for that. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>